Yakov Savitsky, all the way from Vegas, LinkedIn guru, expert, wizard. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Man, I am doing wonderful. How are you, us? I'm good, but I'll ask the questions, okay? Don't don't turn this around on me, man. <laughs> you know, salespeople, you know, we're always asking those questions. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. How, how does that feel? It feels good. How does it feel to have <laughs> to have that answer? <laughs> All right, man. So you are the second of my guinea pigs going with a little different format. Now, that, these are a lot of questions. And I, I used to have people do this in writing way back before I had a podcast. So I'm still kind of getting the flow for the questions. I may leave some out or whatever. But if you're super concise and impactful, we can get through it. Are you ready? Well, let's do it. We can try. So just like in a court of law, right? Yes, these easy ones, like how long have you been in sales? They kind of get you in a flow and you think you got it covered. And then then I hit you with the, the big ones. But how long have you been in sales? My whole life, man. Even like as a kid, I was always persuading people, influencing them. So I would say my whole life. Come on now. Are we supposed to believe that? I mean... I don't believe in the born salesperson. I think that's more more or less of a, of a lie. I think everyone can get skilled up and get better. But absolutely, man, I've just always kind of had a knack for communicating with people, influencing, persuading, and that's something I've always enjoyed doing. So when did you start doing it for money? <laughs> when did I start doing it for money? Man, well, the first time I got paid to sell something I was just in the neighborhood and I was selling my dog walking services. So we could say, what, 14, 15 years old and I was selling for money. But I, I know what you mean. You know, I'm kind of I'm messing around a little bit here. My no, first that's, that's awesome, yeah. though. I mean, I, I've been telling my son for years, both of my boys, and, and they're gonna, about to turn uh, uh, 19 and 20. And I've been saying that, you know, I was like, go offer to wash cars, go mow yards, go walk dogs, go scoop poop, right? There's a whole franchise around scoop and poop. Uh, that's... And so <laughs> getting out there and hustling at 14, dude, that's legit. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's always that sort of opportunity. So that was my first sales thing. And then I, I was in school, you know, I started a fraternity out there. So I was selling people on joining that. That's a whole whole different thing. That's really the first time I was selling an experience, right? Selling potential. It's one thing to sell, you know, a time for money service. It's another thing to sell potential or an end result as you know. Yep. Cool. Uh, do you have a particular sales methodology you follow? Uh, just, I think, I think the standard process, um, ha having, being able to diagnose, you know, well, first of all, it comes down to finding the right prospects, right? I do a lot of prospecting through LinkedIn, which I'm sure we'll get into here. Also do some through Facebook, have a couple of different streams for doing that, right? But all, the actual sales conversation, the actual process, um, you know, the pretty, the standard stuff, identifying that problem, customizing a solution and being there to help the prospect make that buying decision. So you say customize. I mean, do do you customize? Do you do you try to have a standard offering and just find the right prospects that fit into that? I think with high ticket, you have to customize, right? You're doing a prospect a disservice. You know, if you're charging anything more than nine ninety seven and up, you're doing someone a tremendous disservice if it's not the right fit for them, right? And I I found that out more and more as I've gotten into what I'm doing now. Where I can say, sure, I have this info product that's going to cost a little bit less, but is it really the right fit? Is it really going to help them get the results that they want to get? And oftentimes that's not the case. So realizing that and customizing it and having you know the right solution, because the most customized solution is me working with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Now, not everyone's going to be able to want to invest that much to have that happen. So it's really finding out you know where they are and how to bridge the gap to where from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, cool. Uh, I mean, do you attribute that to any particular sales trainer or anything like growing up? You know, did you try to emulate anything or did you learn a particular methodology like in corporate America? Or is, would you say your method is just kind of self-taught and through accumulation and, you know, osmosis of being in the business? Man, I think most sales training sucks. So I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think a lot <laughs> of it is outdated. 
It's not easy to understand, and it's built to constantly upsell and make more sales. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because the people who came up with it are salespeople. So right. I mean, more power to them. However, how I really learned how to be more systematic about selling, a couple sources. You know, I'm in Ryan Stuman's program, so learned a lot of the prospecting stuff from him. But you know, we all we all know like Grant Cardone and those old school guys, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy. So studying them as well. And then when it comes to marketing. Dan Kennedy. But, you know, one really good book that I read a little while ago, I was actually selling timeshare at one point, believe it or not. So that's we could get into that story. But the top guy, he recommended this book. It was a small little book, about 115 pages. It was called Secrets of a Master Closer. I believe the guy was Mike Kaplan, and he's got like an eight-step process. And essentially all professional selling processes, I mean, they are the same, but it's just a little bit of the nuances and how things are worded and presented. Right. And so I read this book and it really it was the simplest breakdown of the sales process, especially the B2B process that I'd ever seen. So that 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 was one that was really good. And a lot of people haven't really heard about. Yeah, I was I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he's going to name a book that I know. I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know that book. <laughs> Secrets of a what? Of a master closer. Secrets of a master closer. All right. I'm, I'm looking it up. I'm going to add it. I'll add it to this interview right now. Sweet. Um, so who who was your favorite sales manager and why? Favorite sales manager, man. I've had had a few different ones. Uh, that, that's a really good question. Let me see. I like the type of sales managers who are a little bit more on the aggressive side, right? Who are just like all about performance, making things happen. I really... I can really relate to kind of that sort of approach when it comes to sales versus the laid back ones who are very nurturing and caring. That's good, right? But it doesn't, I think when it comes to really sales and especially when it comes down to closing, we all have to be able to channel that that certain competitive energy, that drive to really just push ourselves. And the type of manager who I really work well with and even the type of client who I work well with now is someone who what has that achievement motivation who wants to get those results and is willing to you know put in the what what's required put in the energy put in the time and really stop at nothing so you like to be aggressive i mean it does one come to mind like was it your timeshare manager or yeah the the timeshare guy he was really good man the guy he was smooth just kind of charismatic but he was still aggressive you know no nonsense getting stuff done so but it's also you know i think the the thing that holds a lot of those aggressive a type salespeople back is not having an open mind you know we'll talk about the old the guy who's been in sales for 30 years and you know, he's got a big ego about it. he's done well but if he's not willing to adjust and learn about things like linkedin prospecting for example he's gonna get left behind i don't care how good of a salesperson he thinks he is right. sales has just changed so much and that's really the huge opportunity that's out there today yeah uh what's the most you've ever sold in a year most I've ever sold, man. I'm. It could be money, or it could be like total deals. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you the exact number. I mean, that's it's a really good question. I think the, the answer that I want to give you is every time, every you know, every step in the sales process is its own little sale, right? So. Sure. Getting someone to say, who the hell is that guy and what's he talking about to, okay, this guy clearly knows his stuff. I want to listen to him and eventually invest money, right? Because that that was a big change for me going from the corporate job that I had to making my first sale of what I do now is, wow, this person is a business owner. They've been in business for a while and I can really help them and they're willing to spend money. And like when I made that sale, I realized it's in a way that sale in itself had its own significance because I realized that she's paying me for something that I've created that I've come up with versus something that I'm doing for someone. And that was, that was a big thing. That was a big realization. So, you know, just no matter what that number was, just, you know, the fact that that money was exchanged for the value and that those were the circumstances that really kind of opened my eyes to what's possible. And I think, you know, as, as you guys probably know, your audience, you know, it's not a secret. I'm a fairly young guy. I'm not much older than your sons. So I'm, I'm not like this 20 plus year in the business, you know, old sales dog. But every transaction, man, every sale that I make, you know, every new client acquired is a relationship, right? So 
when that when that comes into fruition, when that really begins, that's the point where I just always enjoy each one, no matter how many, no matter if it's for a you know something that's a little bit more low ticket or if it's something high ticket. I just always enjoy that process and enjoying at the end of the day that that person committed and said yes and put their trust in me to deliver the result. Right. Um, do you remember your biggest like one time close? Yeah, that I, that I do remember. So to this point, when I was working, I was selling uh, third party logistics. So if for anyone who doesn't know what that is, you buy something online, it gets picked, packed, shipped to your door. The company I was with, we did the picking, packing, shipping at our facilities. And I was on the B2B sales side selling to these e-commerce companies. And the biggest one I closed was for about $130,000. And that was a B2B um, working with the decision maker. It was a kind of we did it in about a week and a half, actually. So she had a need, and it was it was a pretty quick process. But I mean, I remember the stress that came with it. And people at the company, we they were used to a slower process. And I was like, guys, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, because I knew she was ready to make a decision. She had a ton of questions for me, but that one felt good. So that, that's the biggest one to date. So you said it was 130, and it took just a week and a half. Was that right? Yeah, but she was an inbound lead. I mean, to be to be fair, she was an inbound lead, but she was definitely shopping around and and it, it's a complex sale as well because she has a specific product. She's got to know that we're going to do all these different things for her and that it's it's the right fit for her. So I'm not right. going to take entire credit that I went out and found her and you know made right. a phone call or did something epic like yeah, that. Yeah, that's but, fine, but you handled yeah. it. I mean, because sometimes uh, those inbound leads can be tougher uh, because they're shopping. Right. And they have their Excel spreadsheet and they have literature and brochures and even quotes from your competitors. Uh, And you're going into it blind. Right. Most rookie salespeople are like, hey, boss, I got a live one. This is a sure thing. They called me. And I'm like, my my antenna's up. You know, when that happens, like, whoa, let's, you know, bluebirds don't just happen magically. (laughs) You know, it's like, what's (laughs) going on? Uh, and so, uh, I mean, it's cool. So you handle it. So why, why did she buy from you? Because she probably was shopping, right? Yeah, she absolutely was. And she told me right off the bat. So it's kind of paradoxical, right? We always get excited inbound lead. It's a sure thing. We're going to close this one, but then they always make it clear that they're shopping for a reason. They have a need, but there's plenty of competition and that field does have plenty of competition. So I think what she really enjoyed was just like me really taking the time to speed up the process not BSing her, just giving it to her straight up, and really the issues and the challenges she had right away, customizing a solution and making sure that not only she felt like she was listened to, but just giving it to her frank and giving her the pros, the cons, and saying, look, you know, it's it's going to be one thing if you want to shop for price. We're not the cheapest ones, but if you're looking for the best service and the best fit, this is what we can offer. And that's that's really the, the key thing because, like you said, a lot of inbound leads, they are price shoppers. And anytime they're buying based on price, I think a salesperson and a business owner is just putting themselves in a hole. It's just it's not a good way to start that relationship. Yeah. So what did you learn from that process? To take time out of the equation, to be transparent, um, to communicate clearly, but to also – Listen, and you know, I, we're all growing as salespeople. I'll be the first to admit I'm not perfect. I'm not, you know, near where I want to be, and that's okay, right? But just listening, you know, shutting up, listening, and then responding accordingly, but also keeping my frame, you know, and not buying into some random objections. Or, you know, sometimes we get prospects who test us and want certain things, and a lot of the time it's just to see if we're really who we say we are, and so learning all those things and putting those pieces together. I mean, it was a good feeling when that one closed. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, um, you know, it's funny. You talk about, you know, like, like why did she buy from you? And you said, because you were willing to speed it up. You know, most salespeople are like, what? You know, I'm always willing to speed it up. But in reality, a lot of salespeople are like, oh no, I have my process. You know, you have to watch our slide deck and I'm going to send you a manual and brochures uh, and they don't know how to how to dance at the prospect speed, right? But still stay in control. You know, it's it's there's a lot of nuances going on there um, that you did to to make that happen. So, you know, that's uh, that's cool, man. Hats off to you for that. Uh, do you remember the biggest deal you ever lost? 
Man, <laughs> I try not to think about those. Ah. <laughs> Are they any good salesperson? Yeah, as much as we lose, we try not to think about those. To be honest with you, I couldn't couldn't say right off the top of my head. I mean, there were deals there that weren't quite that size that that we didn't get for whatever reason. But I, I try not to think about it. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on, man, you gotta think about it. Uh, but I, I hear you. I mean, we've all we've all lost a few here and there. Um, so what's in your library? What's in my library? Mm -hmm. That's that's a good question. Well, most of my reading is done via audible. So most of my books are portable. I've got a few that I actually have hard copies. They're sitting here actually in my closet. But, um, so what am I currently reading? I just started a book. It's called Psycho Cybernetics. It's one of those classics that I keep hearing about. So I said, you know what? I might as well listen to it. But a couple of my favorites, Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Yep. I should actually probably look at it again because that book is just, man, it's, it's pro- probably the best sales book I've read in terms of sales processes and sales management. Um, other good stuff, you know, the, what am I, the, what can I think of the top of my head? Anything by Dan Kennedy that I've looked at is really good. Direct response marketing. I think he's a salesperson, especially in the modern age, you have to start understanding marketing and those processes but that's let's see what else i can think of um as far as power of broke by damon john that's good that's one that i listened to pretty recently um there were a couple other ones i'm gonna look through my audible right now as we speak so i don't i don't miss any i'm sure i've got a couple more titles here um we've got robert cialdini you know influence persuasion all that good stuff one that I read pretty recently, it's by a guy named Jeb Blount. He does a lot of B2B sales. It's called Fanatical Prospecting. Yep. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. So those are a few. Yeah, I've had uh, I've had Jeb on the on the podcast. Uh, nice. He's a prolific writer. Good grief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a very knowledgeable guy. I like the way. He, you know, he looks at things holistically. There's a lot of people, and we can, we can kind of segue, I'm sure, we, as we will here in a second, but there are a lot of people in the camp of this whole social selling thing that social media is the only way to prospect now, cold calling is dead, all that stuff. Then there's the other camp that's like, no, cold call, make 10x harder, more calls, you know, th- that sort of camp. And I like how he's, he's sort of in the middle, and he makes a good point, all right? Both of them are effective. It just comes down to what the best strategy is for where your prospects are, how to get your message across, and how to fill that pipeline. It's ultimately about how to get results. Yeah. I hear you. All right, man. Favorite movie? Man, off the top of my head, Fight Club. I like Fight Club. <laughs> Classic movie. Real Dude, good one. You're not supposed to talk about that. Yeah, well, when you when you ask that question, right, what else am I supposed to talk about? No, you can't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> All right. Uh, how do you relax? <laughs> that's that's a really good question I, I recently got back into meditation but you know i live here in vegas so i'll go out once in a while and just enjoy myself uh, and just enjoy i like the way you just kind of toss that out and just enjoy myself <laughs> all right how do you start your day how do i start my day well on a good day you know i'll wake up i'll do i'll do my thing in the bathroom you know put contacts in do my hair all that good stuff then i'll write down my goals and I'll start with some education, either reading, video, I like to start it that way. That's be, that way, you know, I feel in control. I'm starting it on a positive note and it starts to build momentum. Um, do, do you avoid email first thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't do email until I educate unless, you know, unless something dire comes up that I'm expecting. But no, unless, you know, I never do email first thing. My phone's on airplane mode until I decide to take it off airplane mode. So first hour of the day is usually on airplane mode. Nice. Very cool. How do you end each day? I'm kind of the same way, you know. Um, I'll write down my goals, take a shower, and, yeah, I'll, you know, listen to some stuff, try to get in a good mindset, and, yeah. Uh, do you get eight hours of sleep? Usually not eight. Usually between seven and eight. I try to. I find that when I get less than six, it's just it's. I'm just not the same person. But yeah. I try to get closer to eight. It just depends on the day. Yeah, that's cool. That's still pretty good compared to most. Um, what's your uh, what's in your pocket, man? What's your smartphone? You said airplane mode. So is that a? I'm gonna guess an iPhone. 
It is not an iPhone. I'm an Android guy. I've uh, always been. Maybe one day I'll do iPhone, but I've got an S5 right now, Galaxy S5. Uh, very nice. All right. What about uh, CRM? What do you use? CRM, man. I just started using Zoho. It's not bad. I've heard good things about Pipe Drive, but um, I'm more about the autoresponder. And I mean, I keep it like with my business right now. I use a lot of social media. I use spreadsheets, all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I've never, never been the best at CRMs and all and all that good stuff. So maybe I could take a page or two out of your book. Man, there you go. You know, there there might be a quiz over at bestcrmforme.com. <laughs> best CRM for me. I'm saying everybody, best CRM for me. There might be a free quiz you could take to find out the best CRM for you. Or you know what? You could head on over to the CRM Sushi Podcast and check that out as well, but I digress. All right, man. How do you stay organized? So you already kind of mentioned it. So Zoho, spreadsheets, uh, you got online tools, you know, Evernote, things like that. I have an app in my phone called Keep. It's a Google app, and oh. I plan my day out every day. And I don't, I don't use Evernote per se, but keep can also sync with email and if i if i you know need to remind myself i'll do an email i'll make it a draft and i'll just you know keep it as a draft but other than that i've got i use google docs i use you know spreadsheets if i need to but i mean i I keep it really simple i don't have any super complex and as you know this company grows i'm sure i'm going to have to get a little bit more systematic about some of those things but right now i just keep it simple because i'm a one-man shop at this point yeah cool so how do you handle or prevent slumps? That's a really good question, man. Because <laughs> we all have them, right? Sure. So meditation is good. Like sometimes it's good for me to step back or sometimes it's really good for me to just completely do something else, right? If I feel like it's not going well, go to the gym, go out, do whatever, you know, walk outside, but not not sit in the same place and just think, oh, what could have I done better, right? And just, you know, getting back into education, right? So if I, you know, if I feel like something isn't going quite the way I want to or something, you know, didn't convert it the way that I wanted it to, I'll go back, hit the books, watch a video and take a couple things away and start implementing. Yeah, got you. So um, since you are a young buck, maybe, maybe you don't even know this, but how would you say the market or the industry, the profession of sales has changed in the last five years? Social media has changed it, man. I mean, what I do, LinkedIn, it's it's changed. It's never been easier to access a decision maker. And there's never been more possibility to generate inbound leads and exposure for free without paying for ads. That's never been there. So right now, there's there's kind of two camps, like I talked about a little bit earlier. There's still the old school salespeople who still want to knock on the doors and, you know, beat down the prospects. Then there's more of that permission-based selling approach, more based on inbound marketing. So that's been a big change. But technology, man, I mean, I, I was fortunate I grew up with it, but it's it's changed sales and sales is only going to continue to change, right? Where a lot of the SDR activities, a lot of that cold prospecting, it's going to become much more efficient. And, you know, we're going to eradicate really the annoying people. And we're going to be talking with more and more prospects who are actually interested and who are reaching out to us. And that's really the goal because a lot of salespeople, you know, no one really likes prospecting. But now there are more efficient ways to do it, and it's not as painful as you know making 200 calls a day to a list of cold leads. It's it doesn't have to be like that. For some industries, maybe it does, but now we have these technology, we have technology, we have these tools that can also help us throughout the sales process to make more touches and build that relationship, manufacture a relationship that otherwise we may not have been able to manufacture. Yeah. So, you know, you bring up an interesting point that, yeah, it never has been easier to get in somebody's inbox. But, you know, as a result, aren't the inboxes getting more cluttered? Uh, I know I, I get hit up. I mean, I got hit up today on, on Facebook with uh, a private message from somebody I wasn't connected to. Uh, and, you know, they're pitching me somebody to be a guest on the sales podcast. Uh, and I just ignore it. You know, maybe I'll go back later if I if I'm running low on gas or something. But I, I'm pitched like crazy on that. And um, do you think you know social inboxes are going to become as cluttered as email inboxes? They're already becoming like that, and a lot of salespeople have no idea how to use them. They'll do just what you said. They'll pitch on that first message, which you should never ever do unless that person 
compl- knows who you are already and knows you know that you guys have a mutual connection or something like it has to be a very rare circumstance but that's one of the dumbest things a salesperson can do but a lot of salespeople still do it so that social inbox is already really cluttered just like the email inboxes but that presents a unique opportunity for people like myself people like yourself people a lot of the people listening who want to get out there and learn the right strategies but if you approach it in the relationship building kind of way and if you really know how to pitch without pitching right i call it trojan horse prospecting right you you know it's sort of like you presented the story of troy where they had the horse and they wanted to get in get inside you know the fortress right and instead of them doing an all-out attack where they they would be killed they were in the horse and they got in no problem and they you know accomplished their goal right now we're we're not trying to destroy anything or slaughter anybody i just want to be clear when we prospect on social media that's not what i'm saying at all i am saying it's better to have that relationship layer and be a lot more subtle about it and let it kind of you know happen more naturally without the the pitching and just annoying people right especially with linkedin man i mean you talk about b2b salespeople trying to come up with the perfect template perfect message to send people on linkedin it's the it's the dumbest thing in the world like you should not be pitching no matter how perfect your template is you're gonna your conversions are gonna be way low and it's it's just gonna it might it's something that's so negative it could turn someone off who might have been interested in doing business with you or who might have even been in the market for your product or service. If that's how you do business, you pitch them with a generic template that you came up with on LinkedIn. It, they'll say, you know what, this isn't a person I'm gonna want to do business with. So it's absolutely a challenge facing salespeople, and that's why you know I like what I do so much is I help them come up with the right strategies for reaching out to people and for prospecting on LinkedIn and Facebook and for doing it in a way where they're going to get results. You know, you young bucks, you just think it's all new. (laughs) (laughs) It's just a new medium, but it's all the same. But, you know, I do love what you're doing because LinkedIn (laughs) is a great way to get right at somebody. And that is that is so, it's so much more powerful. It's so much easier now. You're right. I mean, you can, God, these databases and the things you can do for free. I mean, do, do you even use the paid version of LinkedIn? I don't actually. And I discourage most people from using it unless they really know what they're doing and they have their strategy dialed in. You can get 98, 99% of everything you need on LinkedIn for free. Now, if you're if you want it to be more like a CRM, absolutely Navigator is a great investment. But besides that, especially for people using it a little bit more casually or just starting out, you can get most of the stuff in with the free account. It's just so powerful. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so if you were not in sales, what would you be doing? Man, well, everyone's in sales, Wes. Ah, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you weren't being paid to be in sales, would you be like a dog groomer? Would you be a, a botanist, um, a coroner? <laughs> Come on, a singer. You'd be a singer, wouldn't you? Uh, man, I, I don't think I'd be a singer, man. I would – what would I be? You'd be You'd be with the guy. You'd be the thunder down under. That's what you do at night in Vegas, isn't it? I bet <laughs> that, that's what you do. I mean, it's 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 one activity that a lot of people choose to enjoy out here. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a way of self expression. But those guys, if I if I really wanted to prove a point here, I would say those guys are salespeople, right? They're selling an experience. They're they're playing on people's imagination. They're creating interest, if you will. So they're still in sales. There you go. Amen. Everybody's in sales. Um. So you touched on a little bit on on what you're doing with LinkedIn. I mean, if people are, are considering it, you know, do they have, um, do you have any type of free training or a blog or, um, anything they can kind of wet their whistle with, or do they, they dive right in with consulting with you? Yeah. So the best way to do that is just to connect with me on LinkedIn. I post on there daily and I put out two articles every day. I also do live videos on Facebook a few wait, times a wait, week. Wait, 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 what, 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 what? You do up to two articles a day on LinkedIn? No, a week, a week. Oh, a week. All right. I was like, yeah. Man, that's prolific. They, they would be a little much, right? That would be but <laughs> maybe I'll try it one week, see what kind of results I get. Ah. But from... 
from from what I know about LinkedIn, though, that wouldn't wouldn't be the best approach for most people. But yeah, so I put out articles on LinkedIn and then Facebook. I do live videos. I cover all sorts of different topics, usually related to LinkedIn and sales and marketing and prospecting. You can go to the website, you know, check out a little bit more about what I do. I have some FAQs, but it comes down to, you know, people understand what knowing, understand why you need to be on LinkedIn. Right. And it's one thing to be on there and be a passive user and you know, understand how it technically works. But it's another thing to integrate that into your prospecting strategy and consistently generate leads and referrals from it and make sales. And that's what I specialize in helping people do. Now, so an interesting thing is, you know, why, why post so much on LinkedIn versus your own website? Because uh, I know it kind of cuts both ways. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I know there's more eyeballs, right, you know, on your website or uh, on LinkedIn than you might have on the website. Uh, but conversely, you know, we don't own that platform, right? We don't own Facebook. We don't own Twitter. So we're posting content on land that we're leasing. So how do you, how do you find that happy medium? Well, if you really want to hedge your bet, I would say make sure that you post your LinkedIn content, which I do to your website. But LinkedIn is going to get me eyeballs and it's going to do it for free. If I just post to my website, and I've made this mistake before of different projects, different things, posting to a website and sometimes somehow thinking that traffic is going to magically appear and want to engage and buy from me. And that's you're much better off, especially LinkedIn with its SEO capabilities. And the one great thing that I really enjoy about LinkedIn's algorithm is People outside of my LinkedIn network are going to be able to see my content. If people in my network start engaging with that content, people in their networks are going to see it. So not only are they going to look at it as something credible, something that already has social proof, but I'm going to organically reach. You know, I did a post, what was it, the other week. I've reached almost 1,500 people. I didn't spend a dime to boost it. Got a ton of engagement. And the guy, you know, who I mentioned in the post, he's gotten some inbound leads from it right there in the comments. And that's zero paid advertising so it's a key thing because the name of the game in what we do was is traffic right you want eyeballs you want traffic you want engagement you want to take people through your sales process and just by posting to a website unless you're going to pay to advertise and get traffic there which is certainly a good strategy but organically through linkedin they're going to help me get people to see my stuff and it's really it's a great hub to put things and if you're concerned about you know, renting versus owning, if you will, you can always syndicate and put things on your website. I mean, there's nothing that's going to stop you from doing that. But that's that's the place, especially, you know, in our in our industry and what I do for other salespeople, other marketers, it could be a little bit different. But LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, they'll get people to see my stuff and you just can't beat that. So are you saying is it all right to basically have duplicate content? I mean, will you copy and paste uh, an article you put on LinkedIn and put it on your own website? This is literally what I do, and I recommend this. Depending, Again, it, it's, it can be kind of nuanced depending for what someone does. But what I do is I write it in LinkedIn Publisher if I'm creating a unique piece of content, right? And I'll take that link, and I'll ha- I have a free free article section on my website or you know, f- free content section, and I'll put the, the headline, and I'll, I'll hyperlink it to LinkedIn, that's that's what I do. As far as Facebook Live, you know, when I do the live streams, I need to start doing more of this is getting those bad boys on YouTube, too. So that can help as well. But also there's no reason not to share it on a website. But I just think the whole concept of website has just changed so much. You know, it's it's not it's no longer enough and never, never really has been enough just to have a really great website. I don't necessarily want to drive traffic just to my website. I want to drive them somewhere to where they can get value and start moving through the sales process. And I want to, you know, engage with them in that way, not just to my homepage where they can be a casual observer, right? And we're really, you know, especially if we're running ads, right? Anybody running ads to just a homepage, I mean, you're doing yourself a major disservice. So uh, that's that's really my my thoughts on that. I mean, I know some people may disagree and say the website is key, which it which it is. But for where I am and for what I'm trying to do, and the model that I have right now, that's that's really the best way to do it. Down the line, that might change, but you know, in this stage and for a lot of people, they're kind of in the same boat. Yeah. So you had mentioned somebody he got inbound leads from the comment section on a post. Uh, yeah. Do you mean he just started engaging with somebody and they nope. or did they click and go to your website or their site or something? How, how did that lead happen? Or can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, it's, it's actually a lot more simple than that. So the, the guy, I'll, I'll tell you the post that I did, I mentioned him in the post. He's got a credit repair company. Post got some engagement. Inbound leads, people were commenting who didn't know him saying, hey, my wife and I need help with credit. How can we reach you? That's that's an inbound lead to me, right? Sure. Yeah, he didn't he didn't comment or anything. It was just my post. Mention him. Mention what he did, and that that was the lead. So just something as simple as that, you know. Right. Um. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so so tell me again. You're saying so you engage every day and you post two new pieces of content every week to LinkedIn. Yeah, two new pieces. So LinkedIn Publisher right now, and the algorithm might change a little bit. I hope it does, to be honest with you. But right now, I don't get nearly as many eyeballs on my articles as I do on regular posts on LinkedIn. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So oh. being able to post consistently and get that engagement, I know which kind of posts get the most engagement. So that's what I'm posting because I want people to see it. And I want people to comment, but I want people, I can see analytics. LinkedIn shows you analytics for free, by the way, of how many people saw your post. So I like to track that to make sure that I'm getting that exposure. And I'm not, again, I'm not paying to boost these posts on LinkedIn. Right. Yeah, I mean, I when I think through, I, mean, I log into LinkedIn every day, and but I don't read very many articles. You know, I am I'm I'm checking out somebody's posts. I'm seeing who's who's talking, who's engaging, and and take it from there. And you know, one out of ten when I see somebody with an article or something, will I go read that? Um, but it's I'm much more there to engage versus consume. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's another great way to start building those relationships is engaging on people's content because a lot of content doesn't get engaged with, right? Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, you have someone who's a potential prospect. What better way is there to initially start the relationship than to comment on something or to give it a like, right? Because they notice if, if something's been up for 36 hours and no one's engaged and you comment, hey, great article, or you better yet you ask them a question about it, how excited do you think they're going to be, right? That's, that's a way to quickly get on their radar versus doing what all these salespeople are doing instead of sending this elaborate pitch message that gets them absolutely nowhere. So in other words, you need to stalk the, your ideal prospects. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we use the term social recon and developing relationships, but you have to be interested, right? Social recon. There's a nice spin. Are you in politics, man? <laughs> no, I'm in sales, man. Everyone's everyone who's in sales is in politics. Everyone who's in politics is in sales. I hear you, man. I hear you. All right. So um so final words of wisdom. I mean, what should our listeners do? After uh, after listening to this, you know they're they're on a they're jogging, they're on airplane mode, right? Because they're on an airplane, listening. They they can't log in yet, but as soon as they get back to their desk, what should our listeners do to put your lessons into practice and start growing through LinkedIn? Absolutely. So if listeners are serious about using LinkedIn to generate leads, get more referrals and fill their pipelines, and I'll give you a couple of statistics here, right? If you don't mind. Sure. Number number one, average LinkedIn household income over a hundred thousand dollars. So people wow. on LinkedIn, they have money. The the people who are using the LinkedIn the most, they tend to have money. They tend to be more serious business people. So even if you're in the B2C space, you have a huge opportunity on LinkedIn. Right. And a lot of the key decision makers, key executives, key influencers, they're spending more time on LinkedIn in terms of looking for motivation for business opportunities to build relationships than they are on Facebook. You know, sure, they'll spend time on Facebook. But that's just kind of to mess around. Right. But if they want to have that business conversation and if they want to think in terms of business, they're going to be spending that time on LinkedIn. Also, anyone looking to reach millennials, millennials are by far the fastest growing demographic on LinkedIn. So marketing to millennials, that's a whole new angle that you can take on LinkedIn. And I teach a lot of that when I work with clients. And the last thing that I'll mention, Microsoft bought LinkedIn last year, $26.2 billion. So wow. they're, they're, they're in it. Yeah, it's quite, quite, you talk about a large deal, man. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty big, right? So LinkedIn is definitely on the come up. It's changed recently. Huge opportunity out there. So if you're not utilizing LinkedIn to its fullest, and if you're in sales or in business, 
you're missing out on a huge opportunity and now is really the time to get in. So if you're ready to really optimize your strategy, make sure that your presence there is what it needs to be, you can go to linkedleads.us slash consultation. That's linkedleads.us slash consultation. You can apply for a complimentary sales strategy session. What that'll be is we'll kind of go through where you are on LinkedIn, see where you want to get to, and I'll give you the recipe or the recommendation for what you need to do to get there for the, the next step and what will help you get to from where you are on LinkedIn to the kind of results that you want to achieve. Right. So, and for everyone listening, because I misheard it when he told me before we started hitting record, but it is linked with an ED, right? Yep. And, uh, and we'll link to this as well in, uh, in the show notes here on the podcast. Uh, and I recommend you check it out. I've been, uh, we talked about this before. I was considered an early adopter of LinkedIn. They, years ago, they sent me something. I was one of the first 100,000, I think they said. And, uh, and how many, was it 400 million now or 600 million? 467 million and growing. That's amazing. So, um, yeah. hey, I finally got into something early. <laughs> that, that yeah. You, implode. <laughs> you got in way early, man. Yeah. I've. What, what year did you get in? Uh, I want to say, I don't like 2004. Was it around then? Uh, wow. Yeah, I definitely wasn't on LinkedIn back then. I'll say that. When when did LinkedIn start? 2003, I believe. So yeah, you, 2004 it? sounds about right. I, I want to say it was 04. I, I was starting, I started with a startup uh, out of Austin. And I remember I got on MySpace then <laughs> And uh, I, I read a post, I read a book actually that was talking about, you know, grabbing your virtual real estate, you know, and of course my space, I mean, I, I think I still have a login, but I, I don't log in, but you never know what's going to make it right. So when something pops up, go grab some digital landscape. So you own your place. And so, so you can grow with it if it does grow. And, um, so I know I got on MySpace and I was using it for business, believe it or not, selling technology as a startup. Um, but I, I think I created my LinkedIn. Well, actually, will it tell us? Because like, like Twitter tells you, you know, user sense, blah, blah, blah. Let me see. What does my profile say? Oh, do you have to go into your profile to see that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm curious. View, let me see. View profile. So Maybe that, under, under your account? Yeah. So you got to go into your profile. And then, but yeah, so it yeah. says I joined Twitter in October 2008. So that's pretty early. Mm-hmm. Um, but does it tell you on LinkedIn? I've, I've never seen it, but man, maybe, it, maybe it does now. Under your account, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it might. I doubt it. But Come on now. But yeah, yeah you, you stopped me, right. man. You, you stopped me already. Hey, look at this. Da, da. <laughs> Member since January 5th, 2004. Nice. So I actually joined that before I joined that startup. I was with another technology company, but it was in the telecom space and they were struggling. And um, uh, actually, I got laid off like six weeks later. <laughs> wow. Yeah, member since January. Look at that, man. I'm an early adopter. Woohoo. Yeah. 13 years. Awesome. All right, man. So this has been awesome. So Yakov Savitsky. Did I say it right? Did I say it right again? Did I say it right twice? You did. You nailed it. Look at that, man. Awesome. All the way from Vegas. Uh, thanks for sharing your words of wisdom on the sales podcast, man. It's been awesome having you. Absolutely. Enjoyed being here. All right, man. Now now go meditate and go do whatever you do in the city, <laughs> but, uh, but be nice about it, okay? Yeah. There's no delete button on the internet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a great night. All right, you too.